Howdy folks, my name is Jimmy Aiken, and this Sunday at Mass we're going to be hearing the reading from John 20, uh, verses 19 to 31, that deals with, among other things, with the institution of the sacrament of confession and also the conversion of uh, Thomas, the doubting disciple. Uh, in that passage, we read the following. On the evening of that first day of the week, so this is the day of Easter itself, uh, the day of the resurrection, when the doors were locked where the disciples were for fear of the Jews, Jesus came and stood in their midst and said to them, Peace be with you. So we have a resurrection appearance of Jesus. When he said this, he showed them his hands and his side. The disciples rejoiced when they saw the Lord. Jesus said to them again, Peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, so I send you. And when he had said this, he breathed on them and said to them, Receive the Holy Spirit. Whose sins you forgive are forgiven them. Whose sins you retain are retained. So right there, uh, Jesus institutes the sacrament of confession. Previously, uh, as when he forgave the sins of the paralytic, uh, which is recorded in the Synoptic Gospels. Uh, Jesus himself had forgiven sins, and now, and he'd been sent by the Father to do that. And so now he's communicating that mission to the disciples as well. And so he empowers them for that mission by breathing on them to bestow the Holy Spirit on them. And, uh, and then he gives them the specific commission to make it clear what they're to do. They're either to forgive sins or retain sins. Retain meaning not forgive. So um, if, uh, if they're to know which of those they're to do in a given case, they're going to need to know about the sin, and they're going to need to know whether the person is repentant of it. And so that means the person's going to need to confess the sin and indicate that they repent of it. So the sacrament of confession. But that's not all there is to this story. Uh, John then tells us Thomas, called Didymus, Didymus is Greek for twin, one of the twelve was not with them when Jesus came. So the other disciples said to him, we have seen the Lord. But he said to them, unless I see the nail marks in his hands and put my finger into the nail marks and put my hand into his side, I will not believe. So Thomas is skeptical of the report that he's being given by the other disciples. Now, a week later, so a week from Easter, the the first uh, first Sunday thereafter, so that's why we're hearing this uh, this Sunday. It's the first Sunday after Easter. Now, a week later, his disciples were again inside, and Thomas was with them. Jesus came, although the doors were locked. So once again, Jesus uh, shows up miraculously, even though there's no fi ordinary physical way he could access this room. Uh, even though the doors were locked, and stood in their midst and said, Peace be with you. Then he said to Thomas, Put your finger here and see my hands, and bring your hand and put it into my side, and do not be unbelieving, but believe. Thomas answered and said to him, My Lord and my God. Now, this is an important statement by Thomas. It calls back, now that we're at the end of the gospel, it calls back to the very beginning of the gospel, which began, as you'll remember, in the prologue with John saying, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. And then he identifies Jesus as the Word. So in the prologue, uh, John indicates that Jesus is God. And now here, at the end of the gospel, someone twigs to that fact. Thomas realizes it. Um, Jesus said to him, have you come to believe because you have seen me? Blessed are those who have not seen and have believed. Now, Jesus did many other signs in the presence of his disciples, John says, that are not written in this book. But these are written that you may come to believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that through this belief you may have life in his name. Many people look at that last bit and say it looks like the end of the gospel, and but it's not the last chapter in the canonical gospel. There's another chapter, chapter 21, which uh, principally records um, the uh, an encounter between the risen Jesus and the disciples at the Sea of Galilee. And some people, uh, many scholars actually, think that is something that got added later 
that John or someone else uh, composed that epilogue and added it. Um, it. There's definitely a literary break here, but there's actually a very good case to be made uh, that both the prologue and the epilogue were originally part of John's vision for the gospel, his literary vision of what he was going to write. And if you want to read about that, um, check out Richard Baucom's outstanding book. I mention it all the time. It's called Jesus and the Eyewitnesses. And he goes over the evidence pointing to the fact that the epilogue was part of the original design of the book. Uh, I'd like to, before I start taking questions, I'd like to comment on a couple of things that different groups have mentioned um, and objected to uh, in this reading. Uh, one of them is an objection that's made by people like Jehovah's Witnesses or other people who don't recognize the divinity of Jesus. Thomas's statement, my Lord and my God, is, uh, is something that is obviously a problem for them. And so they've uh, proposed other interpretations of it. For example, um, there is uh, an interpretation that's been proposed that he's not talking to Jesus there. He's not identifying Jesus as his Lord and his God. Instead, he's just having an exclamation. He's, he's referring to God the Father, and he's, it, it's the equivalent of saying, oh my God, you know, he's just so startled. Well, the problem is that that kind of utterance uh, actually would have been considered profanity uh, back then uh, because it's invoking the name of God as an exclamation, not because you're really talking to God. And that's something that a pious Jew would not have done in Thomas's day. And certainly, even if he had uh, slipped and said something like that, John the evangelist would not have recorded it because it's an inappropriate thing to say um, if that's what he meant. And so uh, when John records Thomas's statement, my Lord and my God, and when it echoes what John himself said at the very beginning of the gospel and something he's actually stressed at different points within the gospel, Jesus' divinity, we can be confident that that's how we're supposed to understand this phrase, that Thomas is identifying Jesus as his Lord and his God. Uh, the other thing comes from a different angle. The other objection that uh, I wanted to mention comes from a different angle. Uh, you sometimes hear it in the Protestant community because the Protestant a community by and large does not recognize the sacrament of confession. And uh, so some people, and I'm thinking particularly here of J. Vernon McGee, if you've ever heard, uh, there's a pro famous Protestant radio program. It's not as popular now as it used to be, but it's called Through the Bible. And it was by a Presbyterian minister named J. Vernon McGee, who was kind of a character. He was kind of a really homespun guy, and he was a lot of fun to listen to. And he had a very popular radio program where over a period of five years, he would read his way through the Bible and comment on it. And I used to listen to tapes of Through the Bible uh, through a, an evangelical lending library uh, in Arkansas back when I was an evangelical. And, um, and, and I would enjoy listening to J. Vernon McGee, but when he hit this passage, he uh, said, well, um, if this, he was obviously skeptical of, of the sacrament of confession here, but he said, um, well, if, if this were the sacrament of confession, there would be a problem because Thomas wasn't there. And so Thomas didn't get this ability and, um, and the people that Thomas then ordained wouldn't have gotten the ability and that would be a problem for Catholics today. Well, <clears throat> there are a number of problems with that uh, objection. One of them is the fact that when bishops are ordained, uh, it's been the long-standing custom in uh, in not just the Catholic Church but Eastern Christendom as well to have multiple bishops con participate in the consecration of a bishop, like at least three. And so, even if uh, Thomas had given rise to a line of bishops that had no ability to pass on 
the ability to do the sacrament of confession, that would have been weeded out through multiple consecrations through other lines. However, there are other more fundamental problems. One of them <clears throat> is that you don't have to be present at a commissioning event to receive the Holy Spirit. And J. Vernon McGee should know this because he commented on a similar event that occurs in the book of Numbers. If you read in Numbers chapter 11, uh, Moses has been uh, really worked to the bone, uh, serving as a judge for the people of Israel. And they're very numerous at this point, and Moses is basically being worked to death. And so um, to take some of the workload off of Moses, they gather 70 elders from uh, the people, and, uh, and some of the spirit that's upon Moses is then put on them so that they can serve as divinely appointed and empowered judges of the people as well. And guess what? Two men who were appointed to be among the judges aren't there. Uh, we're even told their names. They're named Eldad and Medad. And despite the fact that they're not at the commissioning event, the mere fact that they're meant to be judges is enough that the Holy Spirit comes on them too even though they're not there at the meeting, and they visibly prophesy, thus showing that they've received the Spirit. And so you don't have to be at a commissioning event with the Holy Spirit in order to receive the Holy Spirit. If God wants you to have it, you're going to have the Holy Spirit anyway. And so that's one way that um, that uh, that we could look at this passage here with Thomas. There is another, though, and that simply... Jesus commissioned Thomas later. I mean, he obviously felt it was important for the apostles to have this commissioning experience, and he thus would, one way or another, make sure he gave it to Thomas too, because he was sending Thomas out just like the other disciples. And so, um, so either by giving him a private receive the Holy Spirit commission uh, after all of the others, or by just having the Holy Spirit uh, having him receive the Holy Spirit, even though he wasn't there, just like Eldad and Medad did, one way or another, Jesus is going to make sure that Thomas uh, receives the Holy Spirit like the other disciples so that he, like they, will be empowered to perform the commission that uh, Jesus is sending them all out on. So that's what I'd have to say about uh, this uh, week's reading. And let, having said that, let's take a look and see what questions we have. By the way, if you want to make sure I see your question because there's a limit to how far Facebook lets me scroll up, you may want to wait till after I've done my opening discussion before for asking your question. I uh, have a question here. Samantha says, why do some Protestants believe the time of miracles went away with the apostles? Well, um, they, you know, they would have a, a very small number of biblical passages that they would appeal to. Uh, and I should note, it's not all Protestants. On this issue, as on so many other issues, there's not a single mandated position in the Protestant community. And there are uh, a lot of people in the Protestant community, in the charismatic movement and the Pentecostal movement, for example, but also in other movements um, that uh, do believe that God still does miracles today. There are, though, some Protestants who don't. Um, notably, uh, for example, uh, some people in the Presbyterian tradition, influenced by the Presbyterian scholar B.B. Warfield, who wrote a book uh, on why he didn't think miracles continue to happen. And coming from a Protestant perspective, and employing the principle of sola scriptura, you would need to find Bible passages that would indicate that there was going to be a cessation of miracles. And there are a handful of passages. One of the most common is, first, is in the section of 1 Corinthians where Paul's discussing miraculous gifts. This is chapters uh, 12 to 14. And at one point, Paul in chapter 13 is talking about how even though um, even though miraculous gifts are important, or God wouldn't give them, they're not the greatest thing. The greatest thing are things are the three theological virtues, faith, hope, and love, or charity. And Paul indicates the greatest of these is love, and in the course of stressing that, he talks about how love will never pass away, but the miraculous gifts will. 
And so they'll appeal to that passage uh, and say, okay, th that shows that there was going to be a passing away of miracles. And once the apostles' mission was finished, that was when that happened. Well, um, there are a couple of problems there. The first one is the uh, it, it doesn't say that's when this is going to happen. So they're having to come up with the minor premise. The ma if the major premise is there's going to be a time when miracles pass away, the minor premise, and it's going to be with the uh, passing of the apostles, that minor premise still has to be supported from Scripture, and, and it's not. Um, in fact, if you read this passage carefully, it indicates a different time when miracles are going to pass away, and that's at the second coming, when we see God face to face. That's when the miraculous elements of this age pass away, when the new age begins altogether and the whole world is rejuvenated and supernaturalized. And so, um, so that's the real problem for this, is even the major premise, uh, it, it, even though it's true, um, it's one that we're given a time frame for, and it's not the time frame that's proposed by advocates of this view. Um, so that's kind of the biblical uh, basis for this. I think there's also a theological uh, basis for the claim, um, and that is, uh, this is, I don't think, acknowledged generally by advocates of this view, but if you were to say, oh yeah, miracles have been performed all the way down through church history, then you would have to acknowledge all of the miracles of the saints, for example, the Catholic saints and the apparitions of uh, Jesus and Mary and the saints that have occurred. And, um, and, and that constitutes something of a problem uh, because these um, these miracles have a validating effect, just like Jesus' miracles provided evidence for his message. The miracles performed by uh, the saints down through the ages perform, provide a validating function for their message, which is, you know, the, the historic forms of the Christian faith that, um, that the Protestant reformers wanted to move away from. And so I think that under, I think that the real reason historically, I'm not talking about, you know, interpreters today necessarily, but historically, the reason that uh, people in the Protestant community wanted to say miracles no longer occur is because they wanted to invalidate the miracles that had been reported down through the centuries by the saints and thus invalidate the traditional form the the confirming effect that those miracles had for the traditional forms of christianity that the reformers wanted to distance themselves from uh so hope that uh, helps things out let's see um ronnie says <clears throat> i read an article recently about mary magdalene possibly not being a prostitute and that her image was skewered by the author for whatever reason. It talked about where she was from being a wealthy area, and there shouldn't be a reason for her to do that. H have you ever heard of that? N I haven't heard of that. Um, there are various claims out there about Mary Magdalene that are not well-founded. Um, one of them is actually rather common in Catholic circles, the idea that Mary Magdalene and Mary of Bethany are the same person. Um, that's actually not supported by the biblical text. Um, in fact, the, the cues we have in the biblical text indicate that Mary Magdalene <clears throat> and Mary of Bethany are two different people because Mary of Bethany is said, number one, to live in Bethany, and she's also identified as the sister of Martha and Lazarus. And that was common uh, for distinguishing, that was a common way in first century Palestine for distinguishing uh, people because there were a limited number of popular names. Mary was an incredibly popular name at this time. It was the Jennifer of the day. And um, and so to distinguish different Marys or different Simons or different Johns or whatever name uh, you might uh, be looking at, it was customary since they didn't have 
family names, last names like we do, you would refer to them by their connections to their relatives. And so um, in the case of a man, you typically identify him based on who his father was, like Simon, son of Jonah. Um, in the case of a woman, you typically identify her either by her father or uh, her husband or if she didn't have one of those, by her siblings. And that's what we have in the case of Mary of Bethany. She's identified as the sister of Martha and Lazarus. So it seems she didn't have a father at this point. Her father was presumably dead, and she also hadn't married. So that's why she's referred to in this way. The, something similar seems to be true with Mary of Magdalene. Uh, with Mary Magdalene, um, she also apparently didn't have a father or a husband or siblings, at least not ones that were known to the gospel audiences, um, because she's identified by her place of origin. Magdala is a, uh, is a village that's on the north shore of the Sea of Galilee. You can uh, see where it used to be today. Um, I've, I've been by there a couple of times. I haven't I haven't really stopped to look around, but I've been by there. I've seen the site. And today, you know, it's it's ruins. Um, but at the time, uh, my memory is that, yeah, it was a, a fairly well-off area, but just because a fairly well uh, an area is fairly well-off doesn't mean it doesn't have prostitutes or that someone can't, from that area can't fall on hard times and turn to prostitution. Um, the, um, uh, I mean, let's talk, Los Angeles, you know, uh, Los Angeles has some very tony areas, and uh, that doesn't stop there from being prostitutes or people in Los Angeles who are runaways from home or have fallen on hard times and have turned to prostitution. Uh, Las Vegas is another example. Las Vegas has some very wealthy people there, but um, prostitution is even legal in Las Vegas. So um, so I don't find this argument that just because she may have come from a rich place that she wouldn't have been a prostitute. Having said that, um, you know, I would want to do a little checking on, on uh, Mary Magdalene's background before I comment further because uh, I, I just want to verify some details that to make sure my memory is accurate. But I would, that's what I'd say just off the top of my head. Uh, let's see. <clears throat> Sasha says, how can we uh, best reconcile the principle of priests being unmarried celibate men with the common notion of Peter who was married, but more importantly with the scriptures talking about bishops who need to be the husband of one wife? Okay, um, so there are a, a couple of things here. Um, there's no intrinsic connection between the sacrament of holy orders and celibacy. Um, it, it's not, you, you don't have to be celibate in order to uh, be ordained in principle. Um, th and thus, there are married Catholic priests today. I used to work with one. Um, Father Ray Ryland used to be chaplain at Catholic Answers. He uh, worked in our offices. He was one of my colleagues, and he was a convert from Anglicanism. He was an, had been an Episcopalian priest and then became Catholic, and then was ordained as a Catholic priest, even though he was married and had children. In fact, his son, uh, Tim Ryland, the editor of Catholic Answers magazine, still works at Catholic Answers. Um, and so there's no essential connection between celibacy and the sacrament of holy orders. Having said that, um, it, 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 many uh, priests have, it, throughout the history of Christianity, have chosen to be celibate for a couple of reasons. Uh, one is it represents greater conformity to our eschatological state, because Jesus tells us in the resurrection, there's not going to be any marriage. We're not going to be married or giving in marriage. We're going to be like the angels of heaven. And so um, marriage will have, have served its uh, function 
in the history of the human race, but humanity at that point will have moved on. Now, that's not to say we won't still love our wives or our husbands. Of course we will. We'll love them even better than we do now. We'll have a greater spiritual intimacy in the supernaturalized world of the resurrection. But we won't need biological procreation anymore because we're all going to be immortal. And so the human race won't need procreation to continue it. So marriage will have served its function, but uh, that's something that uh, some people model even now because we're modeling by choosing those who choose celibacy are for religious reasons are modeling the ultimate state of mankind. They're also modeling the state of Jesus because Jesus himself was celibate. And so those uh, ministers who are celibate are conforming their lives in a greater way to Jesus's own life. And then there's the practical reason. Uh, if you are unmarried, you have more time to devote to God. And this is a principle that St. Paul stresses. He recommends celibacy to people as a way of having more uh, of having undivided attention and devotion to God. So um, it's this is a gift that's not given to everybody. Jesus himself says that, but it is given to some and those to whom it is given uh, should accept it according to Jesus. And uh, the Catholic Church over the course of history has discerned that uh, at least in many historical time periods, uh, celibacy has been of sufficient value that it's uh, been a normal requirement for ordination um, in many historical time periods. But that's a prudential decision. <clears throat> it's not a fundamental matter of theology. And so the fact that there have been married uh, priests and even married apostles is something that's not a problem. So Peter's um, uh, ordination, despite the fact he was married and according to some early church fathers had children, that's not a problem. Um, about uh, the Paul's requirement that a, uh, a bishop be the husband of one wife, there are a couple things to note. One of them is at this period, the term for bishop in Greek, it's episkopos, and the term for priest or elder, uh, presbyteros, were used interchangeably. Um, the distinction between a priest and a bishop dates to, uh, and the fixing of the terminology for those two uh, offices um, took a while to work out. And, and in the pastoral epistles where Paul's writing in the uh, mid-AD 60s, um, which is where he discusses this, uh, the terminology was still fluid. And so it looks like he's using the words bishop and presbyter interchangeably. And he's talking about individuals that um, are appointed by a higher authority to work in a particular congregation. So what we would call a priest. And in doing that, um, there's no problem, as I indicated in principle, with there being married priests. There still are today. They're just not as common. <clears throat> and in terms of what he meant, um, he wasn't establishing a mandate that you had to be married to be a priest or a bishop. He was establishing a limit. Um, the statement... <clears throat> that a, a bishop must be the husband of one wife has been understood. I mean, the clear purpose there is only one wife. And um, since polygamy was not widely practiced at this time, uh, it was in some places, but it was not widely practiced at this time. Many uh, scholars have looked at that and said, what he means is married only once. So not married and divorced and remarried or uh, or widowed and remarried or something like that. Someone who's only had one wife. But that's an upper limit. That's not a requirement for the office. He's not saying, uh, if he meant you, the bishop must be married, then he would have said that. Uh, he must have a wife. But the fact he says w is to be the husband of one wife tells us there's that he's establishing an upper limit. And so um, the church has never deemed it necessary that bishops or priests be married. You will not find that interpretation uh, being implemented in church history, including in the very early days. Um, so, hope that helps with that question. Uh, let's see. Dennis says, why are various passages translated as sitting at table 
And similar, isn't it bad English? It annoys me. It should be at the table or sitting at the table. Okay, um, so this is just a question about English and its history. Um, sitting at table is an older English expression. It's an idiom. Uh, an idiom is a kind of a standard stock phrase that everybody's aware of and is used to using. And um, in different parts of the English-speaking world, different idioms are in use. And one of them has to do, one of the differences between American English and British English has to do with the use of the definite article, the word the. Um, you will hear Americans say things like, my sister is at the university or in the hospital. But in England, they would drop out the definite article and they would just say, my sister is at university or in hospital. And at, in the same way, in older, more Britishy English, they would say sitting at table as opposed to sitting at the table. So it's actually not bad English. It's good English. It's just older, more Britishy English. Let's see. Uh, by the way, if you want to ask a question, be sure it has a cue in front of it. Dave wants to know, what has I got in my pocketses? Um, I could imagine you having a number of things in your pocketses, but I would suspect that among them is some pocketses lent. So that would be my guess. Lawrence uh, says, Bart Ehrman insists Matthew and Luke assert contradictory things about where Christ was born. Matthew says he is born in, in Bethlehem, and Luke says he is born in Nazareth. How do we reconcile the two? Um, I think there may have been something garbled in uh, transmission, Lawrence. Bart Ehrman uh, acknowledges, unless <clears throat> I'm very much mistaken, he acknowledges that both Matthew and Luke say Jesus was born in Bethlehem. The question is, why was the family in Bethlehem, and why did it then go to Nazareth? Um, the way Matthew presents uh, the matter, um, he's uh, born in Bethlehem, and there's no indication that the family had previously lived in Nazareth. So he's, he's born in Bethlehem, then they have the flight to Egypt, they come back from Egypt when Joseph learns that Arch Herod Archelaus is ruling in the place of Herod the Great, he realizes this is not going to be good because Herod Archelaus is a terrible guy, and so then he takes the family to Nazareth. In Luke, um, he has the family initially living in Nazareth, then they come down to Bethlehem for the enrollment, and then they go back to Nazareth. And so uh, but what Ehrman is saying conflicts is those two accounts, but they really don't conflict. There's nothing at all wrong with saying, okay, the family originally lived in Nazareth. They came down to Bethlehem for the enrollment. Then they were warned to flee the whole area of Herod's domain, so they went over to Egypt. Then they, when Herod died, they came back from Egypt. Joseph learned that one of the bad sons was now ruling in Judea. So he left Judea to go to Galilee, and they went back to Nazareth, where they'd already lived before, and thus knew the place and had a social network. So um, so there's nothing at all wrong with that. That's a simple, easy way of reading the two passages in light of each other. Uh, and by neglecting that option, I think Ehrman is taking an unnecessarily... Uh, skeptical and hostile approach to these documents. Lino says, did Simon of Cyrene carry the cross for Jesus at times, or was he just helping take off some of the weight? The way that, um, that this is depicted, it indicates that he carried the cross itself, that Jesus had, had fallen and, and really wasn't able, given the severe beating, that he had had uh, really wasn't able to to carry it uh, sufficiently, and so um, so Simon of Cyrene did it. Now, in saying that, what it probably means is he carried the cross beam. It's uh, generally understood that when people carried crosses, and they were made to carry crosses as a as a form of humiliating them. Um, but when they were made to carry crosses, they uh, were only carrying the cross beam, and then they would be led to a site where the, the stake or the pole 
of the cross was already planted in the ground because you wanted that stake to be firmly planted in the ground and it would be hard to do that if someone was bringing a full cross and then you were trying to get it into this hole in a way that it would support a person's weight and not topple over. So, um, uh, so it's generally understood it was just the cross beam that Simon uh, would have carried, but it would have it, it it is the way it's presented something that he did carry. He didn't just come along and and help lift it up. Uh, Victoria says, "I find some of Saint Faustina's writings to be strange and hard to believe. I want to believe in the private revelation. Could there be errors in a valid or true private revelation?" Um, so the answer to this question is, yeah, um, this is something that's acknowledged. If you read, if you go on the Vatican website and you go to the Congregation for the Doctrine of the Faith's homepage and you look at their complete list of documents, you'll find their, uh, document from the 1970s dealing with the criteria for evaluating, um, private revelations. And one of the things they mention in there is that uh, if the private revelation contains something that's theologically erroneous, it's a sign that it's an invalid revelation, but it, it may contain something that's slipped in there of a, of a lesser nature or a non-theological nature, something that's slipped in from the seer's own consciousness. And this reflects the common understanding among uh, mystical theologians that when God gives somebody a vision, he uses that person's background and their uh, training and their subconscious and their way of looking at the world to give form to the motions of grace that he's giving that person. And so this is, for example, why people, when they have a vision of Jesus or Mary, will see Jesus or Mary as a member of their own culture. Uh, you know, uh, for example, you know, Our Lady of Guadalupe doesn't look like a first, exactly like a first century uh, Jewish lady, the way she looks and the way she's dressed. She looks more like somebody from, uh, from that culture. And this is a common phenomenon in apparitions. Uh, the background of the person receiving the vision informs it. There's actually a, um, a discussion that I saw uh, Colin Donovan of EWTN, uh, he had, a, I thought, a very good discussion of this principle in regard, it may have been uh, uh, Maria Gretti's writings, but it was one of these um, visionaries who produced extensive writings about the, uh, the, the life of our Lord. And he made the point they may have actually been Saint Faustina, um, but it because it, it, he covered more than one visionary in this piece. But it's on EWTN's website, and if you Google Colin Donovan apparitions and one or two of these names, you should have it come up for you. But he has a very balanced discussion of this, where he also points out that the fundamental thing that is of import in any private revelation is the theological message that's meant to draw us to Christ, the details of, of how everything is put together and, and matters that deal with history and things like that are subsidiary and they, they may, they're, they're not to be um, put on the same level as, and, as scripture, among other things, and they're not guaranteed with the same level of, um, of uh, accuracy as the fundamental theological message. Michael says, by the way, I'm going to do a quick time check. We're going to only take a couple more questions, I think. Um, Michael says, if receiving communion is a good thing, how come we can only receive it twice a day? It seems like the more we receive it, the better. Well, that's a, that's a plausible logic. However, um, there are a couple of uh, there are a couple of things to bear in mind here. One of them is God is not limited in the way he gives us his grace. And so um, he can give you all the grace you need through one reception of communion. And it's so don't think about it as if God is limited. He can only give me a certain amount of grace 
when I receive communion, and so I need to receive it multiple times in order to receive more graces because God can't give it to me otherwise. No, God is not bound by the sacraments the way we are. If you need grace and you receive communion, God can give you all the grace you need in that one reception. So don't have this kind of mechanical, It's um, I, the analogy that occurs to me is kind of like a gumball machine where you need to put in a new quarter to get a new gumball. That's not how communion works um, with the bestowal of grace. Secondly, um, there are people who would take this logic and say, well, if, if once is good and twice is better, then 500 is better yet. And there would be people who would have a scrupulous and superstitious attachment to receiving communion multiple, multiple times a day. And uh, the church, you know, has been in the pastoral business for 2,000 years and is aware that some people have that as a vulnerability spiritually where they uh, become prey to uh, kind of obsessive compulsive disorder or scrupulosity or superstition or things like that that could lead them to uh, in, go to communion in a way that actually would harm them spiritually uh, because they'd be reinforcing bad ideas about oh I've got to I've got to go to communion again or I'm not going to have this particular grace and that's not true God loves you He can give you all the grace you need and so. Um, you, rather than have people have these ideas reinforced, the church says, okay, we need to observe moderation here. We need to trust God. We want some flexibility so you can receive up to twice a day under ordinary circumstances, provided it's the second time is at a mass that you're worshiping at, not just a communion service. Um, so you can have up to two times a day, but that's a reasonable limit. And so we don't want to encourage people to to, to, to get obsessive about this beyond that because that wouldn't help them spiritually. So um, uh, it's, it's a sensible principle. Uh, let's see. Marco says, what is the difference between avoiding conception through NFP and avoiding conception through contraception? The difference is uh, the means. This uh, goes to a very important principle in moral theology known as um, the principle of double effect. According to, and actually, although I can relate the principle of double effect to this, I'm going to do it a little differently because it'll be a little clearer. Um, one of the things, I'm going to go to a different principle, which is that you can't, do, you can't use an evil means to achieve a good end. This is something that St. Paul discusses in his epistles because some people were actually reporting that St. Paul said, let us do evil that good may come of it, because God can bring good out of, out of even evil situations. And St. Paul indicates that that is not his view and um, that uh, people who say that are, are scandalous, scandalously misrepresenting him. And he uh, does not endorse that principle. You cannot do evil in order to produce good. And so um, in the case of the question of should we have a baby right now? You've got a married couple. They're deciding, is this the right time for us to have a baby? Well, the answer may be no. There, they, there may be all kinds of reasons. Uh, they might have to do with physical health or mental health or finances or the number of kids you already have. Um, and you, you may not be able to, to reasonably care for anymore. Let's say you just had two sets of triplets and all of a sudden you've got six kids and they're all infants. Well, um, there can be a bunch of reasons why the idea would be it's better not to have another child right now. Okay, what means are we going to use to achieve that? Are we going to work with God's plan for human sexuality, which has recourse the way he's designed us as a species, uh, have recourse to the infertile periods in a woman's cycle where the uh, human females are still sexually receptive even during those times, and so it's legitimate for us to have marital relations during those times. 
Whereas, you know, with some other species, if the females aren't fertile, they're not receptive. But that's not how God designed us. God designed us so that females continue to be receptive even when they're in their infertile period. Maybe not quite as receptive, but they're still receptive. And so it's legitimate for a husband and a wife to continue to have sexual relations even in an infertile period. Well, that would be one way of working with God's plan for human sexuality to allow the spouses to express their love for each other in marital relations without also um, having a child at at a time when it's not appropriate for them. So that's one option. The other option is, are we going to do something that thwarts God's plan for human reproduction by, say, deliberately uh, sterilizing one of us? Just to take one example, either uh, temporarily sterilizing one of us so that this process of showing love for each other is actually broken deliberately or um, permanently sterilizing one of us. So one of us is reproductively permanently broken on purpose or various other ways of thwarting God's plan. Well, when you frame it in those terms, obviously the thing you would want to do is work with God's plan, not thwart God's plan. So the difference between using NFP towards the goal of not having a child and using various forms of artificial contraception to not having a child is uh, the different is a difference of means. The end, not having a child, may be the same, but the means that you're using of achieving that end, is different. In one case, you're working with God's plan. In another case, you're thwarting God's plan. So that's the that's the basic difference. Okay. Um, Paul says, why is Christ referred to as the Word? What exactly does that mean? Okay. Um, so this is an interesting question. It goes uh, back to John's Gospel. John's Gospel's prologue is uh, where Jesus is referred to in English translations as the Word. And um, I'll need to discuss Greek a little bit here. Um, The Greek term that John uses is logos. And logos is a term that does mean word in Greek. It also means other things like reason. And uh, this is a term that some early Jewish uh, thinkers, not, and not just St. John, but uh, some others as well, like the uh, Jewish philosopher Philo of Alexandria, who lived uh, for in the first century BC and the first century AD. He probably died around the year 50, so he was actually a contemporary of Jesus. Um, Philo of Alexandria, also writing in Greek, saw a lot of significance in the Logos of God. And if you um, uh, look at the beginning of the Bible in the first chapter of Genesis, which John is consciously harking back to uh, in his prologue, in the because they both start in the beginning, um, you see God creating the world by speaking. So God's word in Genesis 1 was the means by which he created the world. And um, one of the items of the Christian revelation is that God created the world through Jesus. And uh, also, you'll notice a person's words when they come out of his mouth are accompanied by the person's breath. Well, the word breath in the biblical languages is the same as the word spirit. And so you see statements like um, in the Psalms about how God created uh, the world by his, his word and the hosts of heaven by his breath. And so you see a pairing of the word and the spirit of God being the means by which God created the world. And so in the Christian revelation, these uh, are further disclosed to us as the as two persons of the Trinity. The, the Father speaks his word, his logos, and sends out his breath, his pneuma, his spirit, uh, to create the world and to work in the world and so forth. And um, so 
that's part of what's happening is the prologue of John's gospel is picking up on that Old Testament imagery about God's creative word and applying it to the Christian realization that Jesus is um, <coughs> that Jesus is together with the Holy Spirit the means through which God created the world. Also, obviously, a, a, per, a man's word reveals what's in his mind. That's how we communicate. And Jesus fully reveals the Father to us. As the author of Hebrews says, you know, God spoke to us in many different ways in past ages, but today he's spoken to us by his Son. Jesus is God's definitive revelation to man and thus his definitive word to man. And that's another sense in which Jesus is God's word. Also, um, I mentioned that the word logos can mean reason, as in, you know, the kind of reasoning you do in your head. And um, one of the things that, that Philo and others have talked about is how God's creation is rational. It's reasonable. It's, it's not a chaotic jumble of things. It's produced according to an orderly plan. And, uh, and, so we have a, a cosmos rather than a disjointed chaos that God has created. And so that's another aspect of the person of Christ, that he um, represents God's rational, orderly plan, not just for creation, but also for redemption. So um, the concept of God's word as applied to Jesus is a very rich concept, and people have written books and books and books about it, but that's kind of a snapshot of, uh, of, of the general concept. Um, one last question. Uh, Manius says, uh, writing in the Greek alphabet, but uh, Manius says, what book are you currently reading? Well, I'm currently reading a bunch of different books. Um, just recently, just today, I was listening to uh, a book about the elements called The Disappearing Spoon, which is uh, a neat book. Um, I, uh, I, it's hard to say. I just, I'm always reading a bunch of books at once. Recently, I reread Richard Baucom's Jesus and the Eyewitnesses. I, I mentioned that one earlier today. Um, but uh, just a bunch of different things. So anyway, um, uh, we're almost up to the hour mark, and I like to keep these under an hour so that people will watch them more. Be sure and uh, like, comment, and subscribe to the videos. Also, share them with others. Uh, hit the If you're watching on YouTube, hit the bell icon so you get notified whenever I'm doing a new one. Um, there's an equivalent to that on, uh, on Facebook. It'll look different depending on whether you're uh, watching on a computer or whether you're watching on a phone or a tablet or some other device. But uh, click the notifications thing. And until next time, God bless, and I'll see you soon.